and I think we're ready to start. Sounds good to me. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, yeah, we're about to begin. Um, if you've joined us uh, in earlier Holy Nights uh, events, uh, you may already know that um, prior to Christmas, there had been a couple of harassment attacks against anthroposophical organizations. And so in order to be secure, uh, we're following the recommendations from Zoom uh, as best as we can. So we'll be using uh, what's called focus mode, wherein uh, we hosts can see your video, but you can't see each other's video unless we enable it. So we'll do so when the Q&A happens. Uh, but until then, uh, you know, Daniel and I can see your video, uh, but the other, other people can't. And that's to uh, avoid any uh, bad actors, you know, sharing anything inappropriate. Uh, so we thank you for your patience there. Um, likewise, too, uh, thank you for your patience with the sign-in. Zoom had recommended uh, requiring that everyone register, which we thought uh, was going to be too extreme of a change with such short notice. So we thought this was a good middle ground. So thank you again for the patience in signing up. Uh, with that, I will briefly introduce Daniel and uh, pass the mic there. Once, once we start the presentation, I will mute everyone and uh, disallow muting until the Q&A starts uh, to avoid accidental interruptions. Uh, so Daniel Hoffner is a member of the Anthroposophical Society and the School for Spiritual Science. He works as a priest of the Christian community and lives in Nuremberg, Germany. Uh, so once again, thank you very much, Daniel, for speaking, and I'll give it off to you. Thank you, Jonathan. During the holy nights, the earth holds her breath for a moment. The time between the years stands still. It is a time when we can feel moved to pause and to ponder where we stand. It is in fact a threshold zone. And a threshold must be heeded. It must be passed intentionally. One is entering into a different space with different laws governing the processes that occur there. And one must behave accordingly. Indeed, it is sometimes even a question whether one may rightfully cross a certain threshold at all. Some of the more important ones are therefore locked or even guarded. I hope someone will give me a signal if I can't be heard or can't be seen or both. You are good, Daniel. It's good, okay. There is a cherub with a fiery sword in the mythical imagination of the gate of paradise. If you come too close in your untransformed condition, you get burned. We live in an age when people are not always comfortable with earnestness. But earnestness is a part of the threshold situation. It's the hallmark of genuine esotericism. People are somehow, people tend to want to open all the doors and to know all the secrets and to tear away all the veils, even with glee, even to deride anything that is a, has the aura of a veiled sanctuary. And that's understandable and we need to become undaunted seekers of awareness. Nevertheless, it's an illusion to think that just looking behind a door, or behind a threshold, will leave you yourself unchanged. The spectator consciousness does not really apply universally. There are certain things, indeed everything, that you see or get to know changes you in some way or another. And the more intense levels of spiritual reality, all the more intensely. That is why there was always such an office even earthly people had the office of guarding the threshold in all of the sanctuaries, 
In the early Christian centuries, this was the first of the seven degrees of consecration. And one of the lower degrees before you become a priest or something else was the ostiary, the guardian of the threshold. Because, because people knew the ritual needs a protection of silence and reverence, but also the people entering the ritual need a protection of inner preparation. Otherwise, they cannot endure what comes to meet them inwardly. Hence, the consecration of the ostiary, as he was called. The unbaptized weren't allowed in to the, to the ritual, for example. That was in the Christian era. And the farther back you go, the stricter this arcane discipline seems to have been. It would be necessary to transform our own inner life in order to become ready for higher experiences. And if you look at the book, Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Attained? Part one, the first, the editions that appeared in Rudolf Steiner's lifetime all said part one on the title page. You notice most of those exercises are not designed to open up the threshold and to open your organs for higher experience. Most of those exercises are to protect you, to strengthen you, to stabilize you, to make you more sovereign in your own relation to your own soul forces, so that when you do enter spiritual experience, which will come anyway, sooner or later, in the course of our development, you are adequate to the encounters and the challenges involved. And yet precisely in our time, when there is perhaps not everywhere an intentional movement toward the spiritual world, the spiritual world is coming to us and hauling us in from the street. The threshold is moving in over us. And Rudolf Steiner predicted that as well. He said people would have experiences, humanity as a whole would have experiences from beyond the threshold, possibly without even realizing it, which explains a lot if you start to look at some of the symptoms and also the diseases prevalent in our age. That is why during the 20th century and already beginning in the 19th, the sensitive divining of artist natures often brought forth images of the threshold. I would like to mention some of those. The list is by no means exhaustive. A couple of famous examples come from Franz Kafka, who lived around 100 years ago. He wrote something he called Before the Law. A man wishes to gain entry into the law, that seems to be a building with a, an imposing portal. The doorkeeper tells him he cannot enter just now. Ultimately, the man waits at the door his whole life. Finally, just as he is about to die, he asks the doorkeeper why, even though everyone seeks the law, no one else has come by this door in all those years. The doorkeeper answers, no one else could gain admittance here because this entrance was meant solely for you. I shall now shut it. And that's how the story ends. Similarly, in the castle, the, the protagonist, K, which obviously is an autobiographical illusion, never really finds out what is in there. Kafka himself, by the way, was someone who met Rudolf Steiner, but did not find the way in to what Rudolf Steiner was offering to humanity. Or in English language, you, you have Thomas Wolfe, you can't go home again. That's, I think he published it, it was published posthumously in 1940. 
wrote it at the end of his life. Wolfgang Borchardt in Germany wrote Outside the Door, a play, 1947, about a soldier returning from the Second World War, a prisoner of war. He returns home crippled and freezing, still wearing the goggles of his gas mask, which makes a chilling impression on the stage. And yet he does not come home because he is one of those for whom there is no more home. Their home is then outside the door, hence the title of the play. He finds himself always shut out. Death appears as an undertaker with the hiccups in this play. And at the end, the, the question that reverberates on the stage is, will no one answer? These are just examples to show that people with a sensitive nature have, have begun to feel more and more strongly that we're excluded from something essential, that there's a barrier. Another beautiful, but also challenging tale is a work of fiction written by the beloved Laurens van der Post. He wrote this book called A Story Like the Wind, a child's beloved home, a great and generous house with an estate all around it is occupied by a murderous band. All the people who lived and worked there die because these, these paramilitaries kill them and only the child escapes. A boy, Francois is his name. The, <clears throat> this child must then destroy his own childhood home in order to stop the murderers. He enters the cellar by night and lights a fuse to ignite a chest of dynamite. Back outside at a distance, he turns and sees the house of his childhood and of his family and of his beloved friends and his nurse go up in a great column of fire against the night sky. He collapses weeping and then flees never to return again. Rudolf Steiner speaks of spiritual beings who have the task of guarding that threshold which separates the surface world of sense appearance from the deeper levels of reality beyond it. His terminology is sometimes a little bit irritating because he uses the term the guardian of the threshold for two different beings. And if you're reading the, the aforementioned book, Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, How Is It Attained? The expression, the guardian of the threshold refers to what is sometimes called the lesser guardian or the lower guardian. But if you read the mystery dramas, the expression, the guardian of the threshold refers to what is sometimes called the greater guardian. And from writing to writing and from lecture to lecture, you have to figure out based on the context, which one he's talking about. There are two principal guardians. The lesser guardian, there too, it's a simplification to speak of only one, but there's, there's essentially one primary lesser guardian. Which we develop in the course of our lives by not doing our homework. When we die, the physical sheath is consigned to the transitory course of the physical world. The etheric sheath is consigned to the etheric forces of the whole cosmos, flows back to the sun whence it originated. The astral sheath dissolves later, but all of these can be partly transformed by us. An extract of the astral body 
in as much as we've made our soul life our own, by our own intentional work of transformation upon our own inner life, stays united with us and passes through the life between death and a new birth. I'm saying these things not because you have to think them that way, but there are some things that Rudolf Steiner said, and maybe it's worth trying them out as a possibility of understanding our humanity. And likewise, whatever we've transformed of the, of the etheric life body, which is harder to transform, and what little we've, tra we've begun to transform as a germ of the future transformed physical body, these go with us. On the other hand, there's also an extract of the untransformed. It doesn't go with us, but it does stay. It waits for us at the threshold. It leaves us before death, and it's waiting for us when we're born again. It is those inclusions in our soul which have not been permeated by our true being, by our I. These inclusions have been densified by Ariman to the level of etheric per perceptibility, to an, to an etheric likeness. Materialistic thinking dries up parts of our etheric body. This is why in the stories and legends, the devil is sometimes shown as having a hoof instead of a foot. Something is dried up. And it's in that element of the dried, non-permeated, etheric, that this astral double can be shoved down one level of existence. And in abnormal circumstances or on the regular path of schooling can sometimes become visible to us. Sometimes a child will do something nasty for no apparent reason at all. A child who is otherwise a good child. And sometimes the child can say, a strange man told me to do that. We may feel free to take these utterances seriously. There is something like a strange being who, however, is a part of us, accompanying us as a shadow, as a double. The shadow, the Aramonic double, would like to shut out the eye, the, the true selfhood, and turn us into a sort of compulsive beings, acting automatically, reacting automatically to the situations that come to meet us impersonally and lower us down to an electronic world. These are things that Rudolf Steiner said about the double in 1917. That's a, a lecture very interesting to those of us who live in North America because it speaks about our continent as well connection with the electronic double. This, this double is much more intelligent than our personality. A superhuman intelligence and a will like a force of nature are its hallmarks, but it has no inwardness of soulful feeling life, no heart forces. Its middle is missing. And it works into our organism by way of subnatural electrical currents. Natural science can actually make these things visible nowadays by means of an electrocardiogram or an encephalogram. It can show the, the electrical tone of your muscle. All of these picture 
technologies, imaging technologies, actually show us traces of the electronic harmonic double, even if the researchers developing the imaging have never heard of these anthroposophical terms. By the way, it's not only in anthroposophy. I sh I'll try to show you an example with the help of this electronic technology. Can you see that? Yes, yes we can. Electrical currents in, the, in a cross section of the human head. These things are there all the time. In psychopathology, the double is well known, not only among esotericists. Heotoscopy is what they started to call it in the 19th century. The ability to, to look, to see yourself, a vision of oneself in all kinds of different variations, especially in psychological disorders, but also under the influence of intoxicating substances of all different kinds, but sometimes among healthy, sober people as well, this will come up. The research, the psychologists of the 19th century who began to research this phenomenon are Duprel, Jaspers, Menninger Lerchenthal, and von Staudenmeier. Von Staudenmeier was able to see his own double at any time. Where the mountains run north, south, there are more powerful magnetic forces coming from below the earth. These subnatural forces are at work in techniques of dowsing and the like, and stimulate the double as well, which is why the North American continent has a special relationship to it. But people all over the world have these things. The harmonic double, according to Rudolf Steiner, causes all the organic diseases that are not caused from the outside. Or to put it in pastoral terms, when we fail to work on our own soul, it will play itself out ultimately on the organic level as disease. There's also a luciferic variation of this double causing the neurotic disorders. The spirit of Johannes's youth is an example in the mystery dramas. It's a part of his ether body which has been filled out with Johannes's unfulfilled karma and sold by Lucifer with Johannes's unfulfilled karma and made independent. In esoteric contexts, Rudolf Steiner sometimes speaks of a threefold double. So there are obviously all kinds of different variations to this. In the Middle Ages, there were mystery centers in Scandinavia where the beginnings of European medicine were developed. I'm now referring to this lecture just mentioned, November 1917 in St. Gallen. The Irish missionaries, especially Columban and Gallus, tried to plead with the authorities to protect Europe from the denser influences coming from North America. Because these, these early naturalists and physicians, they sailed the Atlantic to find certain healing herbs, which could only come from North America. But the influence of the double was so strong there that the Iro Irish and Scottish missionaries said, we have to we have to sever our connection for a time from the West because the delicate plant of Christianity has to become stronger before Europe is able to endure the encounter with the West. And what happened later when Europe rediscovered the West, 
seems to confirm this diagnosis, this, this recommendation. Therefore, starting in the ninth century, shipping across the Atlantic was gradually reduced and ultimately completely stopped in the 12th century. As long as people were still receptive to picture language, they were given images of the double in the form of legends and fairy tales as a type of protection for the soul. Then in the 19th century, we could think of Rumpelstiltskin or a whole lot of others, Ferdinand the Loyal and Ferdinand the Disloyal, the two wanderers where there's this affable tailor and this grim shoemaker who go, always go side by side. In the realm of legends, we could think for, for instance of Parsifal with his brother Firefitz who has to be redeemed and taken along to the Grail castle at the end. Now in the 19th century, two developments occurred simultaneously the discovery of the electricity in the human body and experiences of the double. To begin with, as I said, it was the artists and the poets especially who had these experiences of the double. Then later on, more and more in the form of reports and clinical studies. In the 20th century, the double appears on the stage precisely in Rudolf Steiner's mystery dramas. And the same author urges us to make efforts to recognize the double consciously, understandingly, and knowingly. That would actually be the, the liberation rather than some kind of flight. But Rudolf Steiner is not the first one who brought the double on the stage, but the first one who did, did so with such precision. The mystery dramas show a whole transformation that is possible with the double. Because it is not sufficiently lifted into consciousness, it works unconsciously, formatively in our culture so that we ourselves as, as, a, as humanity become compulsive, and superbly intelligent with a will like a fourth force of nature. In other words, take on the qualities of, of a double ourselves. All right, some of the pictures that we can see of this double, I'll show maybe a couple of them. might be helpful just to make it more concrete. And of course, it, it can be take on very, very different types of form. Paul Gauguin spent quite a lot of time painting a vase. Again and again, he paints this vase with a distorted image of his own face. And then he paints this self-portrait. In the upper right of the self-portrait, you see one of, the, one of those vases that he kept painting. You can see that it's Gauguin himself, but as a, as a failure to become who he really is, who he is trying to become. Then on the other hand, Christ, he, Gauguin paints himself between his own double and Christ. Oh, this would be advanced. If I could show you another picture without no, that's way too much for my technical abilities. We're gonna go out of that and go back in. Real computer people know how to do these things.
Here we go. Asya Turgenev made a very faithful publication of the colored windows of the Goetheanum in this dark light technique. I find it easier to see than some of the photographs. And it has the form of the original windows as well. But you can see this in, in a different shape, executed magnificently by the same artist if you visit the Goetheanum today. On the left, we see this spirit seeker atop a mountain, but he's not quite atop the mountain. He's almost at the top. Before he gets to the highest peak, there's an abyss below him. It's actually in him. And out of this abyss, three unappetizing creatures rise up to confront him. There is one that flaps its wings but goes nowhere. There's another one that bloats itself up with a sneering expression. And there's a third one with a terrifying, brutal look, a bald head with spikes. I don't know if you can make that out in this picture. It's got, it's got a sort of a mohawk for a hairdo. And it's got gigantic teeth and bulging saucer-like eyes and nothing but a slit where its, or, where its ear should be. A, a form of distortion of our thinking, feeling, and willing. Doubt of the spirit, hatred of the spirit, fear of the spirit. And these are things which simply live in us and which need to be confronted. And a proper schooling goes through the confrontation with these beings, not as a punishment because you've, you've been so bad at transforming your soul, but as a preparation so that once you cross the threshold, you will be able to distinguish between the objective reality and your own distortions of it. It's not like the physical world where we, where we are always corrected when we misinterpret the world. The soul world and the higher worlds as well change on the basis of our own error so that our error is self-confirming. That's why we need to pass through the, the encounter with the lesser guardian of the threshold before entering spiritual existence. In the middle window of this triptych, we are invited to become a collaborator with the greater guardian of the threshold. An etheric image of the Archangel Michael lives in the human heart. Down in the lower part of the middle window, you can see this being battling the dragon, which is our own entangled soul nature but not as in previous iconography using a spear or a sword. It's a hand-to-hand -hand combat. The dragon is licking at the heart in order to usurp the cosmic radiance of human thinking. It has to be an etheric image of Michael and not Michael himself, so that we can become inwardly free. The greater guardian is a being of archangelic rank with, to put it cautiously, with the quality of Michael. There are passages where Rudolf Steiner seems to imply very strongly that it is Michael and still other passages where he says, behind the guardian of the threshold, through the greater guardian of the threshold, we can sense the awareness of Christ. Beings are transparent for other beings at that level.
On the right, the spirit seeker has passed the abyss and reached the highest heights. Where the three beasts confronted him, three pairs of angels now minister to him or her. The three beasts, the, the, guard, the lesser guardian, is not gone. They're all three there, but they're partly submerged. They're held in check. You can see them at the, at the bottom edge of the right-hand window. This is a bronze cast of a statue by Ernst Barlach in Kiel in northern Germany. The Spirit Fighter is the title of this statue. This time we get to we get to feel how there's a bestial nature which can serve us if it's put in its place. Barefoot, the spirit fighter stands on the back of the beast. The human form has grown wings and reaches angelic level. Again, something of an image of Michael. And one more picture, and it's the end of the picture hour. If I can find it. This is a primitive color photograph from the early days of color photography of a part of the ceiling of the first Goetheanum. It's from the south side of the small dome, the dome above the stage in the eastern part of the building. This part of the ceiling was painted by Rudolf Steiner after the artists implored him to do it himself. It shows us a future kind of initiation that will become possible when capacities now latent in the Russian or perhaps generally Slavic folk souls will be more developed. And we see in the lower part, in the peach blossom, a devoted human soul accompanied by a darker shadow. Above is the angel. And then also this centaur galloping on eight legs through the cloud, like a storm, part man, part beast, but capable of transformation. The cross and the seven stars show the secret. We can reconnect with the cosmos by developing the right relation to the death forces and allowing them into our own being in the right way. 
those parts of us which must die are capable of transformation. And that's the secret of the double. It, it's not simply to be destroyed. It's to be transformed. The angel makes a broad gesture uniting all of these different parts of our persona, of our, of our composite higher being. All right, that's probably enough pictures. It would be a nice homework assignment to go look for some more. I bet you'd find a lot. And then if you start looking in literature, Goethe has it already. Faust, in his study at the beginning in the famous scene, he wants to get close to the forces that hold the world together and make it work to the deeper realities of nature the macrocosm, the spirit of the earth. And this spirit re rejects Faust and says, you are not like me. And Faust says, not like you, like whom then? And at that moment, the door, there's a knock on the door. And in comes Wagner, the dry pedant who is Faust's eager student and wants to learn all of the information that he can get out of the great wise professor. In this stage direction that Wagner enters the room just at the moment when Faust says, whom am I like? if I'm not like you, great spirit. We have a hint by Goethe that Faust is constantly accompanied by this assistant as a sort of a, of a lower version of his own self. E.T. A. Hoffman, in the movement that they call Black Romanticism, it, it begins, early 19th century, it begins to become very prevalent in double experiences. E.T. A. Hoffman, writes a short story called The Doubles, Die Doppeltgänger, The Doubles, in 1821. Many of these authors who have these experiences were themselves ill, psychologically ill. Hoffman also writes something called The Sandman, The Elixirs of the Devil. All of these are doubles. Guy de Maupassant, that's late in the 19th century. I think it's 1887, he writes, Le Orla, a horror story where this man is, is together with this shadow being, this evil being that never lets go of him and he, he finally can't handle it and dies. Many of these stories end in capitulation, tragically. Edgar Allan Poe writes William Wilson. Evidently a, an autobiographical story since both of the boys, there's a boy named William Wilson and he meets another boy who looks a lot like him and has the same stature and, and is also named William Wilson. And they both have the same birthday and that's January 19th and that is Edgar Allan Poe's birthday. So there can be little doubt that these are autobiographical experiences or very well known as Robert Louis Stevenson, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. They're both the same person in a way, they transform into one another, but the one is master of his own astrality and the other is not. The astrality is master of him. And Bulwer Lytton, whom Rudolf Steiner refers to in How to Know Her Her Knowledge of Higher Worlds, writes Zanoni. Theodor Storm writes a, a story called Ein Doppelgänger, a double. Dostoevsky writes a story called The Double. I've got a list here. Let me see. Ah, yes. Georg Büchner. He. He wrote things which sometimes have elements of this. I guess he's not that well known in the English speaking world, but someone was from Germany here, so I'll mention that as well. Lentz, a fragmentary novel that he left behind when he died, and also a fragmentary play, Wojciech, which has become very influential, despite being incomplete. Franz Werfel writes a drama called Spiegelmensch, the, the mirror person. Oscar Wilde, the picture of Dorian Gray. where a magician type painter paints a portrait 
of Dorian Gray and the portrait changes over time according to how Dorian Gray's inner soul life develops. And because the man devolves into an ever more egotistical creature, his portrait becomes uglier and uglier until he finally has a curtain put in front of it because he can't bear to look at it anymore. And in the end, the only solution is to destroy his own portrait at which point he dies. That would be 1890, 1891, Oscar Wilde. Not just a comedian. Hugo von Hoffmannsthal, the woman without a shadow. It's a libretto for, for an opera by Richard Strauss. Early 20th century. Kafka, the metamorphosis is very well known. One morning, Gregor Samsa woke up to find himself transformed into a giant bug. This is how the story begins. All of these are tragic things. And then later in the 20th century, these are not as well known. There's, there's something called Nelly und Cornelia. That's German for Nelly and Cornelia. Kurt Martens is the author. It's not that well known. It's, a, it's an adolescent double. Nelly is a teenager. And she confronts Cornelia, who is an adult. Cornelia is an artist. But Nelly is, in fact, Cornelia as a young girl. That is, the adult woman, Cornelia, has a vision of her own teenage self who accuses her of losing direction inwardly and betraying all of her, all the ideals of her youth. A challenging thing to read because you, you can't avoid starting to ask yourself, how would I fare in an interview with my teenage self when I bear in mind the things that I held sacred then and that I, that I intended to achieve or strive for at least? The English language equivalent is, again, a little known story by Osbert Sitwell called The Man Who Found Himself. First, the double is older and makes accusations against a young man. And then later, the roles are reversed. The young man grows up and he's confronted by a a young double, his own self, at which point he murders his young double having no proper answer for him and thereby ends up dying himself. Nietzsche had a double experiences. He, he didn't realize what he was experiencing. Zarathustra says in, in the book, Thus Spake Zarathustra, what awakened me from this dream? A child held a mirror in front of him, but he did not see his own face in the mirror. He, he saw the distorted countenance of a devil. And scorn, mocking laughter resounded from this mirror image. And the tragic part is that Zarathustra or we might surmise Nietzsche does not recognize that that's a genuine experience. He considers it to be a deceit by his enemies and goes merrily on into the day, ignoring it. And especially tragic is Adalbert von Chamisso a French aristocrat living in exile in Germany. He wrote in German, Peter Schlemiel's miraculous story. Peter Schlemiel, this is written in 1814, a novel. Peter Schlemiel sells his shadow to the so-called gray man. And Chamiso ends up identifying himself with Peter Schlemiel more and more. He, he signs one of his letters, P 
Peter Schlemiel, whose body I occupy. Shemiso also wrote a short story called The Apparition. A man comes home and he finds himself sitting at his own desk, but he sees it's not really himself, it's, a, it's someone masquerading as himself. And so he, he tries to get rid of him, of the intruder, and, and says, I am noble and you are base. And the, the usurper sitting at his desk argues back at him and says, no, no, you are a low down, good for nothing scoundrel and argues with him long enough that he convinces him. And the autobiographical narrator, perhaps again, Shamiso himself or something of a Shamiso experience capitulates and, and ends up fleeing. All right, these are some of the, some of the artists notions of these things. The double is not simply there so that you notice your own flaws. Of course, it's good to notice your own flaws. The double is there as mentioned previously for cognitive reasons, so that you can understand how much you influence your environment. Primarily how much you influence the spiritual perceptions which you have. People don't necessarily need to feel authorized to write books about all of their spiritual perceptions and immediately go and give a lecture tour about them. It would be better to check them first, maybe. People have experiences now. Our constitutions are being loosened and the experiences are coming in floods and it's, they may be deeply significant, but you just, it's not enough just to interpret them then with your ordinary consciousness and think that you know what they mean a whole different level of schooling is required if you want to do it right. That's the cognitive reason. And the, the social and highly beneficial side effect is you can also sort out how much you influence your social environment if you have some acquaintance with your, with your own double. If you know German, you might know the poem Das Bücklich the little hunchback. The hunchback comes to the little girl and, and bothers her. She can't eat, she can't sleep. These are very modern psychological disorders. She can't, he bothers her at work, he bothers her when she's trying to eat, he bothers her when she's trying to sleep. And finally, he bothers her when she's trying to pray. And then he says, you have to pray for me. So there too is one of the few places where we see the, the double wants to be transformed. And this becomes a major theme in the mystery drama. We can place the double fully aware that, that I myself am that fallen, unredeemed, worm-like being, not exclusively, but that's a part of me. And we can place that at the feet of our own higher self. And let the discrepancy work upon us, let the distance work upon us, because the distance is a catalyst to evolution. And let the grace of the higher self work upon the double. When you have a double experience, your true higher self is approaching you in disguise, disguised as your unredeemed self. And this is stated clearly the first time that the double appears on stage in the Mr. Dramas. The double is seen in the first Mr. Drama by Johannes Tomasius, but we, the audience, don't see the double. Johannes just describes what he's seen. In the second drama, the trial of the soul, Johannes's double actually appears on stage. So you have two figures presented to the audience, Johannes and his double. And after Johannes has gotten over the initial shock, because it's very unpleasant, 
to be shown this vile, deformed being and told that that's you. But after he gets over the initial shock, the double says to him, excuse me, I think I have this translated here somewhere. I must not forsake you. You'll find me often at your side. I leave you not till you have found the strength that shapes me to a likeness of the being that you are to become. In other words, the double has a task of accompanying us and staying with us until under, its, under the influence of its constant presence, we develop a new kind of strength to change the double into a picture of our own future self. All right, I think that's maybe enough about the double. Let, let it just be said, by the by, groups also have doubles. An institution has a good spirit, a good guiding genius, and also an unredeemed shadow being, which sometimes makes itself felt. A class of school children has its good spirit, which can be felt when, when something is happening well in the room, largely depends on the class teacher, but it's not simply the higher being of the teacher. The teacher merely makes it possible for this higher being to work. And a class also has an, a distorted version, a double. The Anthroposophical Society has a threefold double, which Rudolf Steiner himself actually named. He said, at every single one of our meet members gatherings, there are three members in there who don't have a membership card. They didn't come in properly to the meeting, but they're always present. Their names are Milady Naivite, the Bimbo Illusion, and Baron Livright Free from Discernment. These characters disrupt all of our work all the time, says Rudolf Steiner. Naivety, illusion, and a lack of discernment. And he characterizes them as, as people. The one is, a, is an is a noble woman, the other is some kind of a, of a loose woman, bimbo, like an, an unintelligent, floozy type of a person. And, and the other is, is, a, is a carefree gourmand who likes to live free of all discernment. Baron, live right free from discernment. And you can check out your own groups and, and you'll see they're always good and challenging spirits involved. Planets have their good geniuses and their demons. It goes through all the different levels. All right, now maybe a little bit more about the higher guardian. The higher guardian has the task of making sure that we, that we place our earthly lives and our earthly personalities into a wholesome relation to the higher worlds. On our way into spiritual experience, the greater guardian of the threshold has the task of barring the portal as long as we are not inwardly ripe. 
on our way out of spiritual experience, he has the task of showing the way to place our experiences in the service of the needs of the earth. Here, he exerts no compulsion on us. On the way into spiritual experience, he exerts compulsion, if need be, to, to keep us out and protect us, as long as we're not ready. There are indeed certain things which you have to be ready for, including certain types of knowledge. But on the way out of this spiritual experience, he exerts no compulsion. He freely points us to the possibility of using these things for our own personal enrichment or using them to help. This greater guardian of the threshold does not appear in a hundred different pieces of literature. So you can rest assured, I'm not going to quote any more to you. Although it does come, it does come in the mystery dramas. And does not appear, as far as I can tell, in any other spiritual, esoteric streams or schools or traditions. Please correct me if I'm overlooking something there. He seems to be missing. And he plays a central role in anthroposophy. And might I add, anthroposophy also, as far as I can tell, is the only stream among the many, many esoteric streams and schools and fads on the market today and in, in the past, which, which proves, at least in the present, truly fruitful with helpful, even revolutionary new approaches offered to all the different fields of life, really dozens and dozens of different areas. Most of these fruits have not even been tried out so far. Even in the school movement, you, you have to realize once you get more deeply into the material, they haven't tried out most of the things that Rudolf Steiner thought would be necessary for a free school. Although the little that they have tried has proved very fruitful. And then there are his revolutionary new ideas, proposals for mathematics, chemistry, astronomy, zoology, technology, medicine, religion, counseling, the care of the elderly, the raising of children, invention of whole, whole new arts, engraving of glass windows, eurythmy, new approaches in architecture, interior decoration, clothing design, everything. It's a long list. I don't see that coming out of the theosophical movement, coming out of yoga or all of those different Indian things. Okay, I'm probably not aware of all the different things that exist. And some of them have developed some schools, yeah. This seems to me to be connected with the other phenomenon that anthroposophy has much more consciousness of the greater guardian. Because he it is who says in this beautiful passage in Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, how is it attained? You may now go back and serve the others or not. It's very eloquently put. You can read, read it for yourselves if you want in that book. The guardian lives in a strange era where we are becoming naturally more and more opened to spiritual experience, but without necessarily all of us keeping pace with the necessary inner development that should accompany these, this opening. Therefore, the guardian has the task of repelling whole hosts of souls. And Rudolf Steiner describes the encounter of these souls in sleep with the guardian of the threshold in a lecture given 90 to 98 years ago today. 
and the evening, and the final evening of the Christmas foundation meeting. I'd like to ask your patients to read some of this description because it's just worth hearing it in the original wording. He reveals there the reason for the founding of the Anthroposophical Society in the first place. Why was the whole thing founded? Because of this situation that we're in now, which he describes it as the situation of the sleeping souls. It's the closing evening of the Christmas Foundation meeting, 1st of January, 1924, the evening lecture of January, 1924. Let us dwell for a few minutes on the great responsibility laid on us by this gathering with a sense for the spiritual world one could pass by various persons in recent decades. When Rudolf Steiner says one, that's a typical German expression. He often enough means himself, doesn't he? With a sense for the spiritual world, one could pass by various persons in recent decades, observing them spiritually and receiving bitter feelings from this spiritual observation for the coming destiny of humanity on earth. One could pass by one's fellow men of the earth the way one can do that in the spirit and observe these people when they have left their physical and ether bodies in sleep and dwell with their eye and with their astral body in the spiritual world. Yes, exploring the destinies of the eyes and astral bodies in recent decades while people slept. That was the occasion for experiences that point to heavy responsibilities for him who can know these things. These souls that had left their, spirit, their physical body and their ether body from falling asleep to waking up one then often saw these souls approaching the guardian of the threshold. I'll skip a little bit because it's long. All the more in our time, when it is historically incumbent on the whole of humanity to pass the guardian of the threshold in some form. All the more does one find, as mentioned, on the relevant explorations in the spiritual world, how the sleeping souls as eyes and astral bodies approach the guardian of the threshold. These are the significant images one can have today. The stern guardian of the threshold around him groups of sleeping souls of men who in the waking state do not have the energy to approach this guardian of the threshold, who approach him while they are sleeping. Then, when one sees the scene that plays out there, one has a thought connected with what I would like to call the germinating of a necessary great responsibility. The souls that thus approach the guardian of the threshold in the sleeping state, they demand with that consciousness which man has in sleep, for waking consciousness it remains unconscious or subconscious, they demand entry into the spiritual world, the crossing of the threshold. And in countless cases, one then hears the voice of the stern guardian of the threshold. For your own good, you may not cross the threshold. You may not gain admission 
into the spiritual world. You must go back. For if the guardian of the threshold were to grant such souls entry into the spiritual world without further ado, they would pass over the threshold, they would enter the spiritual world with the concepts passed on to them by, by school today, by the education of today, by the civilization of today, with the concepts and ideas with which man must grow up today between his sixth year and basically the end of his earth life. These concepts and ideas they have the property when one enters with them into the spiritual world, the way one has become with them through the present civilization and school, one becomes paralyzed in soul. All right, and one little passage more from the same lecture, a couple of pages further. Therefore, a thundering voice confronts these souls who have quite fallen to the materialism of ideas, ideas worthless to the gods and unworthy of the gods. Therefore, it thunders back at them when they pass the guardian of the threshold in sleep. Step not across the threshold. You have misused your ideas for the sense world. You must therefore remain with them in the sense world. You cannot, if you do not want to become paralyzed in soul, enter with them into the world of the gods. Maybe you can feel when you, when you hear something like that, the description to begin with, it's Rudolf Steiner describing what he experiences when he investigates the destinies of sleeping, of people during their sleep. But it can go beyond that and become something which you which you can, you can more or less hear yourself. Thundering in an unheard region of the depths. Likewise at death, if we are not yet sufficiently developed to work in a higher world, a veil is drawn before the experiences of that world. It all depends on the inner, the will to develop oneself inwardly. Because if the wish is to have some kind of psychedelic experience, it will probably come. But it, it can make you worse rather than better. The inner lamp as the mystics called it, is lit by the spark of the divine. The divine is the being of transformation, not only of grace, where the work of transformation is taken up in earnest, the grace does come to supplement 
or inadequacies. That's simply a matter of experience. In the future, the inner lamp will illumine us through and through, but we have to become permeable for that to happen. Something has to be burned through in the right way. And if it's burned too intensely or too suddenly or before we're ready for it, it can, it can damage us as well. Where, whence do we buy oil for our lamps? to speak in the language of the gospel, that substance that gives itself up to make a warm light. If we are to purchase it, that means we must be prepared to give something up for it. What are we prepared to give up? How do we keep our lamps trimmed and burning? The spiritual world is coming to us. The threshold is coming to us. The guardian is approaching us. Our part is to maintain a flame and to guard it. January is named for the threshold of the spiritual world. That's the meaning of the word. Januwa is Latin for the threshold. The God of the threshold looks forward and backward. That's a good discipline. Even if it's not that dramatic threshold of the spiritual world, but a seemingly less dramatic threshold within our everyday lives. It's always worth being aware, if only for a moment, where did I come from? What got me here? What am I bringing with me? And what do I intend when I cross this threshold? The past is always with us. That's why the work of self-transformation is necessary. But the future is also there already in the form of our intentions and our hopes. People worry, will the thing that I intend to do, that I intend to say, be good? It will be good. If I intend it out of genuine understanding and out of the will to help, that is, out of knowledge and love. In any other case, it will be bad. So that would be the other side of the discipline of the threshold. Out of what inner movement of my being am I crossing into this space? What do I intend to do there? That applies to the deeds, that applies to the words, and that also applies to the thoughts. When Rudolf Steiner speaks about the threshold, it's always stern, even hard to take sometimes. Yeah, but maybe we need that. Certainly, if we look around us today, it would seem it could be a good thing to practice the discipline alone or, or also in groups, of looking back candidly and being aware the whole consequences of all that past are, are still present now and working now and looking forward. 
and trying to become clear. What is, going, what is my contribution? And out of what region of my being am I going to make my contribution? All right, it's been an hour and 20 minutes. Maybe that's enough of a consideration for today. There are, after all, practically every day, gigantic topics being offered in this internet venue, aren't there? At some point, you people have to sleep, or some of you have to get up, go to work or something, depending on where you are. Thank you so much. Is, is that a call then for questions? Sure, if anyone wants to add something or subtract something or correct something. Sounds good. I'll, I'll mention briefly, I've, I've now allowed everyone to unmute. Uh, for the sake of orderliness, I, I request that you use the, uh, the reaction button to raise your hand. Uh, if you're on the telephone, uh, you can use star nine to indicate a desire to, to speak. Um, and yeah, thank you all very much. I see Ricardo with a raised hand. Yes, thank you, Daniel. Um, that was helpful. I'm still trying to understand a little bit about the difference between the lesser guardian and the greater guardian, especially in relationship to um, the mystery drama. Um, when Johannes goes with Maria, to approach the guardian, it's clear that Johannes is not nearly ready. He has a very chaotic soul and dysfunctional soul. So I thought that was the lesser guardian. And the, dev, and the double, I, did, I did, didn't think that was the lesser guardian, although obviously it said something similar to what the lesser guardian did. But the double didn't show any of the good qualities that in the mystery drama of Johannes, and my understanding of the lesser guardian is a mixture of the good, the ugly, and the bad, all in oneness of one being. <laughs> and Isn't so, that Sergio Leone, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> so I have a hard time understanding how Johannes could be approaching the greater guardian in the in the mystery drama when he had so much of his soul was unprepared. Yes. That's the thing. You've got the textbook and you've got the case studies. The textbooks are, for example, How to Know How Knowledge of Higher Worlds, Chapter 5 of Theosophy, Chapter 5 of Occult Science, Threshold of the Spiritual World, Road to Self-Knowledge, and a whole bunch of other stuff, Stage of Higher Knowledge, the case studies are the mystery dramas and, and they show people in spiritual development and they break all of the rules that you read in the textbook. Very irritating. Same thing happens with the karma lectures. Rudolf Steiner gives all kinds of lectures in his earlier lectures about the laws and patterns of karma. Then he gives these case studies, 1924, whole volumes of them, and they all break all the rules. They, it, however, it is explained. Johannes gets a special ex exemption in the Guardian of the Threshold, scene seven. He comes completely unripe, fl aflame with passion. He's trying to sexually molest a dead person, essentially. And, and Maria comes with him. And the, guard first, the Guardian's first reaction is quite correct. He just knocks him on his back and says, go away. But then Johannes keeps banging on the door. It's not just a wooden door. It's masses of moving water on one side and masses of moving flame on the other side and twining themselves. Very well done. A little bit difficult to stage. Maria says, I'll vouch for him and, and I'll take care of him and I'll take the consequences. It's an exceptional state. And he, he gets a special pass. And then 
the very first thing he sees on the far side of the threshold is the lower guardian. It's the backward, the sequence is backwards. He, fi- he thinks he's finally getting a hold of this soul that he, that he wants to marry in her excarnated state, Theodora. And then the veil comes off of the face and lo and behold, it's himself. And he's, he's very disappointed at first, but that's the beginning of his healing as well. Yeah, so that's an exceptional state. Okay, that's helpful, right? Because it is breaking the rules. I get it now. Okay, thanks. Rudolf Steiner does it all the time, and it would seem that life also does that all the time. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the next hand I see up was for Florian. Hi, Daniel. I want to thank you for your contribution. Uh, I think this is a very important theme for our time. And Rudolf Steiner uh, gives both indications for the individual crossing of the threshold, as you know, and the collective crossing of the threshold. And the one of the experiences that Steiner highlights in a certain lecture, I don't recall the exact uh, time at this point, but uh, he says that a, a common experience uh, for the late medieval uh, person on the quest was to experience the skull as the grail castle. Mm-hmm. And the, then there was the wounded uh, Fisher King in there as well. And and the uh, soul in the night lifting out with the astral and the ego was like the the sword being raised out of the sheath. But anyways, in this picture, the, the, the pineal gland takes on a kind of grail quality. And this also comes through in the etherization of the blood lecture, uh, which many see as shedding important light on the grail. Now, the macrocosmic dimension, I want to turn briefly to the very first lecture on December 24th, 1923, at the beginning of the Christmas conference, the first evening lecture. Steiner gives some indications and he has a beautiful sketch uh, speaking about how the ancient Indians experience the whole earth as related to their head. And that where the earth opens to the sun uh, and in the sketch, the earth is depicted in a way where it's upside down in relation to the head and heart, which he shows in the sketch next to it. And he says that they experience the sun as this macrocosmic heart, the counterpart to their own hearts. And I think Steiner is indicating here something significant regarding the collective crossing of the threshold. And one of the few people who research this uh, relationship of the human head to the earth was Friedrich Benesch. Uh, who led the uh, free seminar in Stuttgart at that time. I traveled twice to hear him speak and had questions uh, regarding this. Uh, One of the questions I asked him was whether my own research, which led me to believe that the center of the earth was an organ related to the pineal gland microcosmically, whether that agreed with his own. And he responded, thus can sein, that can be. So in the etherization of the blood, there's a battle at the pineal gland. And I believe there's a battle at the center of the earth. That's the counterpart to that, that involves the whole of humanity. And we're now turning the earth head into a global brain with artificial intelligence and all of these electromagnetic uh, fields that we have added. And so this macrocosmic double, the sun is the heart, the earth is the head. And I just was wondering if you had anything to say about this macrocosmic uh, double and the collective crossing of the threshold. 
and this global brain phenomena that many have written about. Yeah, that's a whole question. What does it mean that humanity as a whole crosses the threshold, regardless of the level of participation of the individual? Since uh, in the 13th lecture to the priests, uh, which is one of the last series that Steiner gave, he speaks there about an interpretation of the book of Revelation that's for specifically for the consciousness soul period. And he states that uh, the, we're in the period of the seventh trumpet and in the 1840s, the sixth trumpet began to sound, which is related to the 10th chapter of the book of Revelation, where the being who has one foot on the water and one foot on the dry land and his countenance is like the sun and rainbow above his head. And uh, he has a book that needs to be sort of eaten by John in a sense. And Steiner says, we have to take this book into the eye. Only the, the priests and the Forstamp members were invited to this lecture, which ended in the 22nd, I believe, which was only a week before he gave his final lecture on the 28th of September, 1924. And he, in that 10th uh, uh, chapter related to the sixth uh, trumpet, that's the collective crossing of the threshold that he often spoke about that began in the 1940s that uh, was concurrent with the battle of Michael with the dragon. And he says that with the turn of the millennium, which is the time we're in now, the seventh trumpet sounds for the woman standing on the moon crowned with the stars clothed with the sun appears and that seven headed dragon seeks to devour the child. So these are kind of images that relate, especially this 10th chapter where he gives a kind of picture just like when we cross a threshold microcosmically, thinking, feeling, willing, separate. In these lectures to the priest, he says there's a macrocosmic correspondence there between thinking in the East, feeling and middle <clears throat> Europe and the West and the will, and that these are separating macrocosmically. And if you look at world events these days, the polarity between America and uh, China, for example, this shows that these three forces on the macrocosmic level distributed among humanity geographically are in a sort of great tension right now. Thank you. Thank you much. In the interest of time, uh, Victor Toso has a hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> let me see if my microphone works now. It does, yes. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I mean, <clears throat> remind me the the, the late uh, priest from Sacramento, California, Werner... Uh, Haig? Uh, yeah, that's right, Werner Haig. I met him when I was half my age after I was leaving a cult in Southern California. And he leaked to me a number of Christian community priests were at that time, uh, lectures to them that were at that time yet unpublished. So he wanted me to enter the seminary. And listening to your lecture, I, I really seriously regret I didn't do it um, because of the, I mean, it's just amazing. I can think of a hundred people I would love to hear this lecture. My question is both academic, one of them is being a prior English major, Dostoevsky had the great Grand Inquisitor yeah. uh, confrontation. Also, yeah. And so that, <clears throat> I wanted to have you comment if you could a little bit about how the double might have been in that. And then more currently, uh, on my last birthday, I, we got noticed that uh, Gazelle Maxwell was gonna be spending some time in prison for the shadow acts that she and, and uh, well, her compatriot have been doing across the globe for many years. The shadow side in this country and the black book that, that, that uh, Epstein had, which contains the shadow of so many of our luminaries across this planet. It's frightful to me to confront the darkness there of our collective deeds that we use our own children 
to 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 gain something and have seem a there seems to be a pass that's going to be given to these people on the ongoing way. And I said to somebody, I said, I was so grateful as a birthday present to get at least the announcement that she was going to prison. But I was wondering for the next year, if I could maybe have the dissolution of the Catholic Church. You know, I'm, I'm really profoundly disturbed by the continuation of an, uh, an institution like the Catholic Church in not coming to terms with that dark, profoundly dark side. So anyway, anywhere you want to comment any of this, I'd appreciate it. With thanks. Yeah. An institution like organized Christianity also has its shadow. And if you, if you set out to be a movement for the renewal of the religious life, and to take on the task that has not been done right so far, you take on that karmic burden as well. And that shadow appears in your own mantle and you have to be careful with that. Sure, the Grand Inquisitor is something like a shadow figure as well. He, he's nothing but a reformulation of the temptations which confront Christ at the beginning, the te- all of which really amount to the challenge to to use supernatural abilities to to do a magical solution to the problems. He accuses Christ of getting it wrong. And from the point of view of his logic, he's absolutely right about this. You got it wrong. He says, "You, you gave them too much freedom. You should just make them good. No. That would work, but then something else would be missing. It would be a compulsory type of thinking. The will would work like a force of nature and the heart forces would atrophy if the grand inquisitor had it, had his way. And Torquemada, that, that's an actual figure, right? I mean, he and people like him were very influential for quite a few centuries there. And we can find things like it in other realms outside of organized religion as well. The real thing of which that is a caricature or a double is Christ, namely the affirmation of human freeness, along with the affirmation of all the error and hurt that can come of it. But the possibility of evolution that's also in it. Well, thank you for this very good lecture. I It'll be one that will be usefully carried throughout this year. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you much. I see uh, Victoria's hand open. Um, oh, I see your hand up. Thank you so much, Daniel. I have a question regarding to the threefoldness of the guardian of the threshold. Where can we read more about it? And, and also does the higher guardian of the threshold has a trifoldness as well and how that will look like? Yes. The threefoldness of the guardian of the threshold is something which comes more in esoteric situations in the esoteric school in the earlier lessons and also in the later lessons of the Michael school as it's sometimes called the class lessons. In the red window, it's obviously a threefold being, and in some other contexts as well. The passage in the book of Revelation, which Florian was quoting before, is the threefold image of the higher guardian. Cloud humanity and rainbow humanity and fire humanity. 
that's in chapter 10 of the book of Revelation. But there aren't that many depictions of the, of the greater guardian, except in anthroposophy. The mystery dramas are the best place. The threefoldness comes about because there has to be a relationship to, to our own humanness. In this central panel of the red Gautiano Mundo, it's a countenance, but it also there are also certain threefold tendencies in the countenance if you look at it. It's not something, as far as I know, that Rudolf Steiner discussed explicitly, but implicitly there there is also a threefold nature to this to this greater being. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, I have a question. Daniel, thank you for the lecture. Would you please name the two lectures that you referenced at the beginning of your presentation? If I could remember them. Thank you. Okay, the, yes, there was one about the about geographical medicine and the double. I think it's the 11th of November, 1917 in St. Gallen. Possibly volume 178 of the complete edition, but I don't re remember by heart. I'm sure Dr. Rentia would know something like that. If someone knows it, you could say it in the chat, perhaps, or, or, or say it out loud. I put the link for these uh, uh, lectures about uh, geographical medicines in uh, the chat. So there you the go. Chat. I knew someone yes. would know the right answer. <laughs> Thank they you. They are online. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jillian, or Gillian. Yeah, and wait a minute, this person asked for two lectures, right? I'm not sure which other one you meant. I, I quoted a longish, longish passage from the 1st of January, 1924, Christmas Foundation Meeting, volume 260 of the complete edition. I don't know if that's the the other lecture you meant. Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Gillian or Jillian? Uh, thank you. Also very, very much gratitude for what has been proved. Um, so, something that I wonder about a lot is in this um, protection of the guardian at the threshold, the higher guardian from the crossing and the lower guardian, it, the, the fact that people are protected from coming back with a paralysis of soul. And as I've understood it, part of that means an, an actual incapacity to think. And my question always is why does, if there's that guardian, protection of the guardian, why does it appear certainly to me that there is such a enormous amount of people who seem to be dis displaying that now, this inability or incapacity to think and this paralysis of soul, which do they slip by? I mean, or is there a, yeah, 
maybe that's not the only place you can get paralyzed. Right, yes. We have, we have a phenomenal system in place right now. Mm. Yes. It's a miracle that anyone could think at all anymore. At one point, Rudolf Steiner told Aaron Fried Pfeiffer, it, it's a question of nutrition. So if you look at this stuff that people eat, in the yeah. agriculture that that stuff comes from, we can be grateful that we can still think. And probably there are other factors besides the nutrition as well. The schooling, the upbringing, mm. the mass media. Mm. Thank you. Yes, it's not only that. And, and maybe I just wanted to just say, I, I don't, can't, don't know this deeply, but I happened to be listening to something earlier today um, where somebody, a doctor was talking about the effect of these um, injections they're giving, they're trying to make us have on the pineal gland. So I thought it was just interesting in terms of what somebody was saying about that. That's all. No, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you much. Uh, I see a hand raised um, in about, I think, 10 minutes or so before the, the scheduled hour is up. Uh, so let me know if, if you're open for more, if there's other questions. But I see Ricardo's hand up. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure you, you described also about um, sleeping souls meeting the guardian. I assume that's the lesser guardian you're talking about in that case. The scene with the sleeping souls is an encounter with the greater guardian who has the, a, a task for all of humanity. The lesser guardian is our own individual, a part of ourselves. We each have our own lesser guardian. The greater guardian is a cosmic being. The good news, which is perhaps easy to overhear when you, when you read this drastic description of the rejection of the sleeping souls, is that they're all clamoring for admission to the spiritual world. They demand entry. So that shows then in the sleeping part of our being, we actually want to unite with the world of our true origin. It's just a question of how to how to be ready for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you much. Uh, I, I see three hands up, two from people who've already spoken. Uh, so if, if it's all right by you, I'll ask Rebecca to speak and we'll check in with Daniel about any remaining questions. Hi, Daniel. I just want to thank you so much for your offering. It was brilliantly developed. Um, I just wanted to just comment. It seems that with the lesser guardian, this is where this threefoldness from different perspectives can also be looked at because it also shows you what your true the highest aspect if we're looking at it the highest part of the threefoldness would be your striving for a truer nature your true eye which is which is also what is the potential so it does have this also this um, higher quality that can have this inner relationship this dynamic with the higher greater guardian which is also a deep mystery of how these two also, when they begin to work together, which is a deeper understanding. Most people don't, it, I, it's a deep mystery. I, I, don't, I can't even articulate it properly to you, but I think it's a brilliant way to develop this, to understand there's a threefoldness to this lesser guardian as well, that also has this true nature um, reflecting down what is our potential to connect to that greater guardian. So I don't know if, um, if that creates a, a clarity instead of it just being 
yeah, this Trinity aspect that you brought to it helps us to understand that there's this lesser part. Then we have this other aspect of development that we can work towards. And then it's leading us to this truer self that then has this potential to unite with the greater guardian and, and develop an inner working in that relationship, which is a new way of working as well as my understanding. Can you develop that a little bit further or, or not? That's right, it's good, thank you. The guardian, the lesser guardian has a pedagogical task with us. In the course of the mystery dramas, in as much as they've been written down at all, the first four got written down, the guardian changes to the double, I mean, as he's called there, evolves very much depending on what Johannes does. At one point, Johannes undertakes a rigorous schooling in thought and the guardian comes up the next time he gets on stage and says that that totally purified me. And he becomes more and more helpful and more and more friendly. At the beginning, he's just confronting him and, and almost seems to be mocking him. He, he holds a ruthless parody of Johannes. But later, he leads him to higher beings. So that seems to confirm what you say, Rebecca. It, it seems like an enemy at first. And for these, for these irregular and un, unprepared encounters, such as we find in, in works of literature and elsewhere, it often does end in disaster. But in a proper schooling, we have to learn to work with this being. It's the most precious thing that we have. The rest of it is all gifts from the gods, right? But this is my very own thing. So that's what, that's what I've got to work with. And if I transform it, it has a warmth because it's gone through experience, personal experience and pain. A warmth that the angels don't know in that same way. And so then we really have something to give when we turn back toward the spiritual world. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, I see that Florian has a hand up. Do uh, you feel that you have time to answer another question, Daniel? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yes, Florian. Did you have a question, Florian? In the lecture uh, day before yesterday, uh, that also touched on this subject to a certain extent of the human double that's spoken about the doppelganger in that second lecture of uh, geographic medicine that you spoke of where the bioelectromagnetic forces are the sheath for these uh, influences within the human organism and that uh, transhumanism and posthumanism, which have moved from uh, sort of uh, movements that were more peripheral into the mainstream, that uh, this can perhaps be seen as a means of the harmonic double who, according to Steiner in that lecture, they have to depart just before death but their goal is to overcome that requirement. And many technologies are converging towards fulfilling what the transhumanists and posthumanists are aiming at, which seems to be a movement inspired uh, by Ariman. 
uh, to create a uh, metamorphosis of the human being in the arimonic direction that is not needing to be subject to death. This would be robotics and artificial intelligence and the like. But I, I just one more uh, insight in regards to this macrocosmic double and the pineal gland that I referenced at the center of the earth as a possibility that in regards to the battle at the pineal gland, Steiner speaks of the polarity of midnight forces and midday forces, and that certain backward brotherhoods work with these through Sagittarius and the twins constellation, and that we needed to work with the morning and evening forces in order to create that balance, and that good technologies could come out of those morning and evening uh, forces. And in another place, he says that what is one day night rhythm for us is a yearly rhythm for the spirit of the earth, which in my view is the Christ. And that when he was asked how we can connect, this was to Riddlemeyer asked this question, how we can connect to the second coming. He said that working with uh, the yearly cycle meditatively. And so this would give, if one looks at that correspondence between day and year, that the morning and evening would correspond to uh, spring and fall, Easter and Michaelmas. And that then working with the festivals, we can potentially reach to the center of the earth where in a conversation with Countess Kaiserling, he, uh, he responded to her vision of seeing gold at the center of the earth, positively saying, yes, that's the case. So that at the center of the earth is the center of black magic for the Rosicrucians. They, uh, the black magician strives there and the so-called sun demon has, wants to take a hold of that organ to, uh, lead humanity off its path, but the Christ has penetrated that same sphere. The plants have their common ego there. And at this time of the year, there's a special relation between the mineral and the plant kingdom at, uh, and the whole earth, you could say. So for me, this battle on the macrocosmic level can be participated in through the seasonal festivals, through living into the year meditatively as opposed to our individual meditations. I'm just wondering if you have any uh, sort of insights into that dimension of the battle for the future of the earth. Maybe it's a topic for another time, course of the year. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm mindful of your time. Uh, it's, it's four o'clock here in Chicago and I understand it's, it's 10 o'clock in Nuremberg. Uh, I do see a hand up. Uh, would you like to answer one more question or shall we close down? Sure, it's Ted. All right, yeah, please. And there was someone else too. She keeps coming and going. Yeah, if you're open, if I remember correctly. Sure, okay. I, I can hang around. Ich glaube, ich glaube, dass ich bin das. Would, uh, ich bin from, from Vancouver, Nevenka, and I would like to ask a very quick question, if that's possible. Sure. Uh, Herr Hafner, uh, ich wünsche Ihnen alles gut in den neuen Jahr. Ich möchte, um, um, möchte Sie, um, ich werde Sie eine very, um, eine Frage Fragen, aber möchte ich nicht, dass sie beleidigt werden. So, here is the Frage. Uh, hi to everyone. Um, please, I, I would like not to be misunderstood, but I would like to, my question to be taken in a very, uh, if not in a serious way, but uh, uh, probably in a contemplative way. 
uh, we are, um, yes, we are all called to advance and move forward. And uh, we are here for these very reasons. And um, we all know more or less that the time is of the essence for each individual and family at the level. And we seem to tem tend to look for the outside world, um, these places that are pulling us down. But I would like to ask a question directly, specifically you, because of your background. What about the society, anthroposophical society itself and the Roscrucian movement where people have gained this extreme high level of knowledge and yet they have become bad apples. So how does the anthroposophical society deals with that? And how does one recognize these bad apples? Because uh, if it, I think you would be, it's, it will be um, honest to say that um, there's a too many forces within the society put, pulling us down. Uh, what can be done about that? And who does anything about it? And what are they gaining by doing it just that? Thank you. Yes, you said it yourself already. It's easy to find places, forces, events, and people in the outer world who are pulling us down. With the Anthroposophical Society, it's no different from the rest of the outer world. It pulls you down as long as you look at the shortcomings of the people who are working there. This changes the moment when you say, I myself identify myself with that, and I want to try to contribute my part. Then I become an agent and no longer a passive recipient of other people's flaws. You still have to suffer with other, other people's flaws, but you take a different inner attitude in the moment when you say, I want to work from the inside. You have to look at it from the outside and say it, it, it is the way it is and it's not as good as I think it should be. Or you have to look at it from the inside and say, I'm responsible for what happens there. I identify that's my effort and I want to make my contribution as best I can. Those are the two possible attitudes toward the anthroposophical society and I think toward a lot of other things as well. The doubt to be good enough for tonight. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Mr. Hafner. Yes. I'm here, I'm here to praise you. And also to ask you, when are you going to come to New York to lift us up? Mr. Petrenko, I, I'd love to. I, I have to have some kind of excuse and I have to sell it to my local colleague. I've only got one right now, so it's a little bit thin. And I have to get someone to buy me a ticket. but. Those are merely external hindrances. I'd love to visit you and see you again face to face. Now, I can't hear you. Let's hope we can work on it and thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, as gracious as you're being with your time, I know too that you know, I and others need to go as well. Um, there's a new, there's a fresh hand raised from Lori. Forgive me, Victor. Um, because Lori hasn't spoken yet, I'll I'll ask if if uh, you'll accept a question from Lori, and then maybe we close. Sure. Thank you very much, and thank you for your patience, Victor. Thank you. Um, just a question: We opened with this special time of um, the holy nights, or this opportunity uh, for uh, yeah, a type of 
a type of spiritual knowing a possibility. And this relationship to Janus, the, the being of January and, and Capricorn, I was, I was looking at the 12 moods and it seems like in the 12 moods for Capricorn, there's this real possibility of future and past meeting. And I was wondering if there was any connection between Janus, this being who is a type of threshold guardian and the zodiacal being or substance of, of this Capricorn. I didn't hear the last few words. It's pretty soft, Lori. Sorry, um, the connection- You're wondering if there's a connection be between what? Janus, the god of January, this looking and forward and past, and Capricorn, this, the, yeah. in the 12 moods, this zodiacal being that speaks so much about how the future rests on the past and this relationship. Yeah, obviously. In the sun line, it's right there. But can you connect? The future should rest on the past. It's conjuncted. But can you speak? May the future, let the future rest on the past. But can you speak about the connection between the, the spiritual being of January as a... It's because Capricorn is the turning point. In the 12 moods, we have the signs of the zodiac, not the mobile, unequal, visible constellations. So Capricorn has to do with the solstice. That's why it's a threshold experience. The year has an ascending and a descending half. Materially speaking, the plants germinate and unfold. They culminate at midsummer. They fall away and return to the womb of the earth toward midwinter, an ascending and a descending. And Capricorn is between the end of the descending and the beginning of the ascending. That's why it has the forward looking and the backward looking quality because it stands at a threshold, hence January. Right, do you, there's a, comment I'm just seeing here from Dr. Rentia, Dr. Ross Rentia, we have two doctors Rentia in the chat, that, that in the Goetheanum, or I think to be precise, we would have to say in, in Hermann Linde's painting of the Goetheanum, the Christ figure is between Capricorn and Sagittarius, that is at the place of the solstice. That's a painting that Hermann Linde made out of his own reimagining of the interior of the Gotanum, interweaving it with the Goethe tale and the mystery drama images. But Rudolf Steiner saw the painting and approved of it and wanted it along with some of the others be exhibited in the Gotanum. So maybe we can say that Linda had a, a true inkling there. Certainly you can feel even without any theoretical knowledge of the zodiac or anything that that there's a turning and people have a tradition also of of ending the year with a retrospect the preview of the coming year is less well developed probably because those parts are not as easy to see but that would be also that would be valuable as well what do i intend It's a threshold situation. And that's why an older instinctive wisdom just placed the beginning of the year there. All right, in China or some other places, there are other beginnings. Every year has multiple beginnings and there's a, the calendar of the soul begins at Easter. The school year begins in autumn. Those are all valid points of beginning depending on what you're looking at. The liturgical year, year begins in Advent. But the nature year and the light year, the year of the, of the sunlight in relation to the earth, that does in fact begin during these holy nights. Hence the threshold.
Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, yeah, I'm really grateful for everything. Uh, any last words, Daniel, before parting ways? A good new year. And to you. <laughs>